Okay, so now we're going to transition and we're going to take a bit of a, a jump back in a time machine. And so to paint a picture before we invite our fantastic panelists onto the stage, I, I spent a bit of time reflecting on what we've observed as Ashoka and Ashoka U over the past decade. And the exchange has been around for seven years. Um, a lot of this work has been going on for much, much longer, but we've had the lucky opportunity to really see how trends and patterns have been evolving over the past decade or so. And so I wanted to start by painting a picture of what we're seeing. Um, with the disclaimer that we have our own particular perspective. We have, you know, the perspective of everyone that we have in the, the broader Ashok U community. So I'm sure there are exceptions to these, but these are really high level broad based patterns. So one of the key shifts we've seen is that over a decade ago, the core terminology that was used was social entrepreneurship. And one of the key shifts that we've noticed, and we've actually done a quantitative analysis of the languaging used for exchange submissions, there's been a quite dramatic shift since seven years ago to now um, to use the term social innovation over social entrepreneurship. They're still both commonly used, but I'd say it was a majority social entrepreneurship, minority social innovation, and now that has probably flipped the other direction. And we also see this as new institutions are getting involved and figuring out how to name their programs and name their initiatives. Part of, part of what I see as that historical trajectory is that a decade, 15 years ago, most of social entrepreneurship was happening in business schools, and so the business terminology and entrepreneurship made the most sense. And as it has shifted to be much more focused campus-wide, undergraduate, not just graduate, and multidisciplinary focus, social innovation is a much more inclusive and relevant term to be used for the much more um, holistic uh, approach to education that has been happening. And then the other big shift we've seen is that, again, when, when you focus on social entrepreneurship, the first gut reaction is that, what do we want to do if we're educating social entrepreneurs? We want more ventures. We want more founders. We, that's the definition of success. And in certain cases, that's how success is measured. Um, it's really a much broader spectrum. If you're really thinking about multiple disciplines, graduate, undergraduate, and an, an array of different people who have different personalities and risk profiles, a small a percentage might become a venture founder, that's true. Um, however, more, uh, more and more people are graduating and leaving with skill sets and mindsets as a change maker, which they can bring and infuse into whatever path they happen to go on to. And in many cases, many of them are becoming intrapreneurs, so innovating and launching new initiatives within existing organizational structures. Another trend is, again, along with the same theme, moving from the, the skills for launching a venture to really focused on what are the skill sets you need to understand social impact? What are the skills you need to play a variety of roles within a sector um, or multiple sectors to contribute towards social impact? There's a variety of ways you can do that. It, it isn't just one path. Um, and then on that note, also, for a long time, as, as there's been a, a growing awareness of social entrepreneurship, more media attention, more convenings, more people aspiring to be social entrepreneurs, that's extremely exciting. And how do we provide a set of role models and pathways that we really need teams for organizations for social impact to thrive? And so I think there's a real broadening and a real sense of inclusivity and a, and a sense that this is really um, not just a specific end goal, but really a much broader set of skills that you can bring into a variety of sectors and career paths. Another set of trends that we've seen is that there are emerging conversations about where does social innovation fit vis-a-vis um, -vis civic engagement? Um, where does it fit vis-a-vis -vis design thinking? Where does it fit compared to service learning, public service, advocacy, philanthropy? And so I think as we're finding, many of these related skill sets and disciplines coexist on many campuses. So how, how might we think about collaborating and becoming more of a, a complex ecosystem to prepare students to have a whole tool set for social change? And, and so as, as we have been at Ashoka, very very much focused on the social innovation lens, one shift and one key insight we've had in the past decade is that, boy, while it's one amazing tool, it's one of many. 
And so I think we've seen this played out in our Changemaker campuses. We've seen it in actually several of the sessions at this particular exchange. It's one of the, the large themes that's emerging is this question of how might we integrate and how might we actually get the synergies that might create a more effective and empowered set of learning outcomes for students that benefit from many different toolkits and sets of skills. And so this is just one, one other pattern beyond the trend within social innovation we're really seeing a trend of how social innovation can blend and bleed and align with related and supportive um, student, student programs and student and pedagogical methodologies. Wanted to paint a, a series of questions um, that I think are part of the next phase uh, of social innovation education. And so clearly uh, there's a question of inclusion and access. So who's at the table, who's not at the table? Um, both in terms of which institutions who, which serve certain student demographics are, are involved in playing a leadership role um, at, in social innovation, but then also at every institution, there's a variety of students with a variety of backgrounds who's actually being drawn into this and how can we be more deliberate to make sure that it's really accessible to everyone who would like to be equipped with this set of skills. And then, it, in certain institutions, there can be a little institutional inertia and some challenges to overcome silos. Um, we definitely see that in, in some cases. And so how might we be creative to break down those silos and not allow institutional barriers? Um, uh, how, how do we not allow them to get in the way of student success and student support? Um, and then I'm giving a preview to some of the, the comments from the panel, but I just wanted to paint context. How might we also really encourage our students to apprentice with the problem and deeply understand the context and content of what they're going into before they jump in with a solution? And I know many of you already think about this, but how do we actually codify this and make this a core part of how social innovation education is taught, where people don't just come in with pure excitement and good intention and, and jump to a solution without deep deeply understanding why and how and, and where, they're, where they're doing the work. And then I think just the key message, in addition to making sure everyone is actually included and welcome at the table, how do we make sure that we are being supportive and open to a variety of pathways so that it is not one successful outcome, that it really is something that is enabling students to be their best self, their best change maker, and that they can align it with a variety of disciplines, a variety of career choices, a variety of skills that different people bring to the table. So with that, I am delighted and honored to bring our panelists to the stage. Um, I first, uh, we'll have uh, Andrew Seligson, who's the president of Campus Compact, Daniela Poppy Thornton, who is the deputy director of the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship, and Sonal Shaw, professor of practice and executive director of the Beck Center for Social Innovation at Georgetown University. Um, and so what we wanted to do is gather three people who've been involved in higher education innovation in the social innovation education space for, for a decade or more and who have a variety of perspectives to bring. And what we wanted to do was, was reflect um, on where we can as educators, as a community of leaders, continue to evolve. And the starting point for that is that we wanted to uh, reflect on what does social innovation education actually mean and what are the pitfalls? This, this isn't, social impact and social change is not a science. It is not perfect. It can often be messy. And so how can we actually look at ourselves at, a, at an emerging field, at a, at a field that is benefiting from the shoulders of giants from related fields? How do we actually look at ourselves, warts and all, and how do we do it in a way that can enable a healthy evolution over the next decade? Um, as we are more deeply embedding a lot of this work into our institutions, how might we do it in as wise, thoughtful, and responsible way um, to our communities and to our students? I wanted to see if I could hear each of your personal first experiences with social innovation um, and just what your impressions were at the time. So if you could just quickly paint a picture and, and then the next question will delve a little bit more deeply into your current perspective on how we can learn and iterate. Andrew. Sure. Good morning, by the way. Uh, 
And I need to say really quickly, uh, I, un, you know, I was inspired like everybody else by the folks from CQ and Laurier, and then I s was reminded of our title with that, that has the perils in there, and I realized that essentially we've been brought here as buzzkill. So that's, <laughs> that's our role this morning. Uh, but no, my first uh, introduction was in 2007, so just right the, uh, the time frame you were talking about, a decade ago, and um, Scott Sherman, I know from the Transformative Action Institute, is here. And so I had just been hired at Princeton University as the first director of civic engagement learning. And coming on board, uh, my boss said to me, we are going to be working with this guy, Scott Sherman, to offer a seminar in social entrepreneurship, and we'd like you to facilitate it. Do you think that would be a good idea? And I had just been hired, and my boss, you know, at Princeton had a class year in her title. She was like the class of 1950. I was like, I think I should probably say yes to this, even though I have no idea what this is really. And uh, I had a ton of suspicion about it. So I'm a political scientist. My background's in political theory and the history of ideas. Most of our academic training is about discovering problems and tearing things apart. This is about building things up and finding pathways forward. And so that was really exciting to me. The insights uh, drawn from positive psychology about how do we actually work to make change in positive ways rather than how do we understand failure, uh, et cetera. So th those things really drew me in and certainly then in my own work I've been informed very much by a lot of the insights from the worlds of social innovation, social entrepreneurship. My initial engagement with social innovation was probably very limited to lots of, I did a lot of volunteer travel and eventually I ran a volunteer travel company and then got really disoriented with, uh, dis with, the, with that work. But along the way, I was realizing that this skill set that I had learned when I graduated from college and gone into consulting was actually being used in a valuable way that was actually much more uh, sustainable than some of the volunteer work I had been doing. I had worked in consulting. I wore a suit every day. It was five days a week business suit company right after college, and I swore I would never wear a business suit again and I wrote off business. I now work in a business school, <laughs> which is humorous. Um, but I, w I went to Cambodia, and I met with a, a classmate from undergrad who was the first president of Digital Divide Data, which you, you might have heard of. They won the school award a few years ago. And I was like, wow, you're using access databases, something I had sworn I would never do again. And you know, you're using your, the, the sales and business skill sets that I had been taught. And you're doing that to employ ex-trafficked women, people with polio, landmine victims, and, and uh, in underprivileged communities in Cambodia. Wow, this is really interesting. So that was my first time that I realized that this skill set that I had learned could be applied to any sort, sorts of problems around the world. When we started the Office of Social Innovation at the White House, you could not get this many people to show up at a meeting. Uh, for anything, <laughs> and so it's great to see a decade later how, how cool it is and how many students are involved in it, So, uh, and to see the disciplines coming together. So congratulations to you, Marina, for what you've put together. Um, quickly, I come at it from a practice to theory perspective. So I grew up in Houston, Texas. Uh, my parents were very active in the community, both the Indian community and the local community uh, within Houston. And so always volunteering, always creating organizations, always bringing people together, always solving some problem. <laughs> uh, whether it's creating a community center, whether it's helping community members who have had problems in their families, other ways. And then my dad, when, we were in our first, when I was in my first year of college, had this brilliant idea wasn't so brilliant when I was there, um, of going to India for three months and traveling to rural India and visiting social entrepreneurs. That time it was not called social entrepreneurship, it was just called service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we spent three months in villages all across India and learning and seeing how people were actually solving problems. And in some ways it helped me as I was uh, at University of Chicago learning about theory and putting it to practice and really understanding what the practice could and how practice can inform theory, not just theory inform practice. And that was kind of my learning into social innovation. Amazing. So let's give it your best shots <laughs> before we figure out how to evolve and iterate. But Andrew, tell me, what, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges um, that we as a collective of educators and higher education leaders should be aware of as, uh, 
as we think about the, the perils of social innovation education? Well, for me, I think one route into that is to think about what have been the most important and, and successful social innovations, for, for example, in US history. And I'll just throw out a couple examples. There's tons of other ones we can think of. One, I would say, is public higher education, starting with the land-grant universities in the 1860s. Uh, many, obviously, of us here have at one time or right now are connected to public institutions for higher education. I think if you were to say, what is the most important reason the United States in the 20th century was the wealthiest and the freest and the most successful society in the world, it's mostly, I think, or due to public high school and public higher education. And that required a tremendous commitment of public resources, public commitment, political democratic processes to make it happen and to sustain it over decades. Another one you might throw out is environmental regulation, right? We've shown over the last 40 years that you can be wealthy and increasingly wealthy while also making your air cleaner, your water cleaner and safer. And we've done that through public policy, public engagement, political will and commitment. And so the critique I think would be uh, that I think there is a flavor in social innovation education and in the sector that is s cynical about state action. There's a sense like things are too slow through government. Uh, we can do a kind of end run around it and make things happen without engaging the difficult, slow processes of building support, building consensus. And unfortunately, I, I certainly don't want to make a causal link here. I want to make that clear. But we're seeing right a very significant erosion in commitment to these public goods. So we've seen it already with public higher education, 40 years of disinvestment and the, you know, all of the student debt burden, et cetera, as a result of that and, and other bad effects. And unfortunately, I think we're on the brink of seeing it with environmental regulation and the potential gutting of the public institutions that have provided us with the environment that we all need. So I worry that we aren't focusing enough on building the capacities in students to build consensus, to work across difference, to cultivate large-scale support, and to accept, you know, Max Weber called politics the slow boring of hard boards. And that's real, but it is also the way things get done in ways that can have huge impact for whole societies. Great. Daniela? I think that one of the key things is that we're, at least at Oxford, we are moving into the area, we are educating these elite, well-educated students to then think that they have the responsibility to go solve problems for people whose they, problems they don't understand, right? And so increasingly, the number of students that I see that are pitching business model ideas for, my, oh, my joke is always apps for Nigerian farmers and they've never been to Africa and they've never farmed, right? It's not really a joke because this is what, our, our, what we're seeing proposed. Now, there's great in, good intention there that we can harness. Part of that is our fault as educators because at least in business schools, we're often teaching that you take your business and you have you know, your USP and you start to increase your market share and you outcompete and you, your, your organization gets bigger and bigger and then you, you start to have, you know, become a big company and, and that's and then we've translated that to thinking that that's going to mean you can solve a problem and get bigger but actually social change happens in systems it happens with governments it happens with activism regulations it happens by changing big businesses that already exist right so we need our students to go into all of those things right we need to give them the skill sets the accolades the incentives the, the role models in all of those things right we also need to give them funding into all those things. Right now, a lot of our students, the only way to get funding afterward when they care about an issue is to pitch a solution to a business plan competition, right? And what about all the rest of the students who want to go change the systems that already exist, right? And then, who are we funding? That's the key question for me. I mean, we just, we're being hosted by Miami-Dade. We've heard about their student population, the issues that they have gone through. Each of us have gone through different things. It doesn't mean we need to, take on the issue that we happen to have lived, but there's a lot of young people who would like to. And there's a lot of my students and probably a lot of your students who want to take on issues they haven't lived. So how do we connect those people and how do we start giving those money, that money and those accolades to the people with the lived experience? Awesome. Okay, see, that's just not fair to follow her. Um, I, I, I only want to add to, I think, what both of them have said. I think too often social innovation is taught as one solution, and too often we don't think about social innovation as a broad solution. 
So how do we think about it from a legal perspective? How do we think about it from a business perspective? You do need business models in a way to operate, but the business models by themselves are not enough. It's not just some financial model that must be missing that the social community just couldn't figure out. It's because the philanthropy model and the financing model, frankly, sucks. Right? You, get, you get little bits of money to do a lot of work, and they want to see impact that's here, but the money is down here. The government doesn't fund properly. The government also funds for number of people served and very little for the impact that you can have in the communities around you. So how do we change policy to make that happen? Because policy also has to change. And then how do we think about all the legal structures that stop you from doing interesting things? I worked at the White House. Half the time, people would say, oh, but the lawyers said no, <laughs> right? It's the only sector, and this is the difference between the business world and, and the social world, right? In the business world, the lawyer says, what do you need to do and how do I help you get there? In the social world, the lawyer says, no, you can't do that because the regulation tells you no, as opposed to let me help you get there. A venture is one of many approaches to contributing towards social impact, but if you're really thinking systematically, and, and again, many of the Ashoka Fellows, they are not content until they've at least addressed national level change, which often requires policy change to actually achieve scale and pervasiveness. But many, many of these ideas have solution potential for across multiple borders in many countries and sometimes even globally. And so again, how, are we even giving that as a pathway to our students? Are we encouraging students to think about the longer term? And again, many of these Shoka Fellows, you know, it's not a, a semester long project. It is three decades of their life working in a very particular deep uh, consistent, thorough way, and so a lot of, when you're talking about the, the level of entrenchment and the level of issues we're talking about, it's a multi-year, often multi-decade commitment. Um, so I think just, again, as educators, how are we providing a whole series of pathways and providing a whole systematic way of looking at it? Kind of switch up the order a little bit, so we'll start with Daniela, um, of just as this whole crowd are either educators or developing the philosophy of education at their institution, how would you encourage people to think about it based on what you've learned? Change maker needs three things. We need skills and inspiration. And I think as a sector, we've been really good at that. We've been looking, you know, we're holding up the role models, giving them inspiration, and we've given them skills. I think sometimes it's too narrow. We've given them skills in how to build a business, and we need to give them wider system change skills. How do you lead without authority, et cetera, et cetera. But then we have, I think, a really important piece, and some of you are, are probably working on this really hard, is helping students understand themselves better and giving them leadership support so that the ones who don't think they can do it but they really understand a problem, we're supporting them to be able to do that, and the ones whose ego is leading them out the door, we can kind of give them a, a bit of feedback and, and help them be more humble and inclusive, and, and just helping support students to understand not everyone is supposed to start a venture. If you're great at research, a lot of these Ventures need researchers, right? Let's help our students find their best place in the world. And the third piece that they need to understand is understanding problems. And, and that term, apprenticing with a problem, I stole from the people at BYU uh, in, in my report, Jessamine, uh, uh, at the Peary Foundation in an interview said that, and I love it. So we created some funding, which we call Apprenticing with a Problem Funding, to solve that problem I mentioned before, because before we only had money if you wanted to start a venture, which meant we had these kind of type A, small number of students are saying, I can solve that problem, let me tell you how my solution is unique, right? And instead we're saying, actually, if there's a problem you care about and you don't know about it 100% yet to say that I have the answer, we'll give you money to go out and get an internship, get a job, do some research and learn, right? We started something called the Global Challenge, which I'd invite you all to join. We have 23 universities uh, as part of it this year in partnership with the McConnell Foundation. We're running it across Canada. And um, that is, a, in, it's, we call it, internally we call it an unbusiness plan competition. So instead of winning because you have the best solution, you win because you have the best understanding of a problem and mapping of the landscape of current solutions that can be built upon and learned from and the current gaps. So what might be available? A gap might be an opportunity for a business, but a gap might be advocacy, education, regulation change, all sorts of things. We changed our business plan competition. It used to be you had to be a current student. 
And after doing this research, I said, we need to change this because we're basically saying you need to do your MBA or your PhD or whatever you're doing, and at the same time, be starting a venture enough to be able to pitch it to us that we should give you money. Now we say, you have a lifetime opportunity to apply for that funding. Go graduate, get a job. So uh, I just, before I give my comments, I just want to say, uh, we're the at the Beck Center, we're located within the provost's office of Georgetown University. So as many educators know, we're not in a school, which uh, is good and bad. So we test out classes before we actually turn them into classes. Our first year in operation, we tested a class called Social Impact at Scale. Uh, it was only voluntary. Students didn't get, to get a chance to actually, uh, you don't get credit for it. You just got to take the class for eight weeks. And they worked with an organization in the Philippines that feeds 20,000 children a day and needs to feed 100,000. And they had to break down the problem and think through what could solutions look like from a systemic perspective. Uh, we had 115 students sign up within a 24-hour period. We took 20 students and ran that class. And because the class worked and the feedback was we needed a full semester, eight weeks wasn't enough. Uh, and they were coming once a week for three hours mm -hmm. to take this class on their own. And that then became a class, and that we taught through one of the schools. One of our professors, uh, Randy Bass, has been working across the university to create a university-wide classes. So every student taking classes across the university could take and get credit for these classes. So the third year in, we're now a university-wide designation, so students from all the schools can take that. But the idea being is just how do we even test within our own institutional structures new ways of operating to give experiential learning to students that they are putting theory to practice and practice back to theory. Um, the second thing that we offer, and similar to kind of what Daniela was talking about, we do slightly different in the sense of students go work for 10-week internships across the, you know, across, around the world and now in the United States also. Um, un unlike many other places, and we decided to try it this way as a test for ourselves, uh, we actually design the projects with institutions and countries and, and within the United States. And what we offer is a six-week orientation before the students go, 10 weeks of the, of the program, and then once they come back, they have to do three weeks of reflection. What did they learn? Why did they learn it? And what are the systemic issues to help them think through that? Um, partially just because it was a way to think about how do we integrate more into the learning concepts, and now professors are getting involved in different ways. First year, no professors. This year, almost all of the schools have professors that provide guidance to the students along the way. So it's about 25 students, and we're, we're now partnering with, either, with each of the schools to take their students, and we're running the program across the university. But again, reapplying that methoding, test, testing methodology. And as we learn more, and we learn from other campuses, we try different things uh, to do that. And, and then the last thing I think is really thinking about um, how do we think about teaching students about entrepreneurship along the way, what Daniela was saying, that is entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. So you can change systems if you can go into them, but if the system doesn't allow you to change or if you don't think about the systemic places, so do you go into government? Can you go into a large organization? And I think our challenge as educators, and I think one of the things that we need to learn for and offer to the students is a willingness to make those mistakes. They are going to get it wrong. They are going to make mistakes. But we also need to help those institutions that we may work with let them make those mistakes. You don't learn unless you make the mistake. And I think the challenge for the social sector generically is that in institutional settings, we don't want the new thinking because we're too afraid that we might make mistake and that might create a problem. So both within the university and ourselves, but also across the institutions where people may go work, these guys are young and they think anything is possible. We all thought that when we were 23. Let them learn that and let them work through it and let them make the mistakes. But failure seems to be not an option and failure is where we learn the most. For me, uh, maybe three, three thoughts about kind of things we need to do uh, to move this work forward. One is at the level of whole institutions, we have a significant and growing body of empirical evidence that basically says this. If you want to graduate students committed to lives of action and service of the public good, you need to exemplify that throughout your institution. So that's one of the reasons I love the Changemaker campus approach. But students have to see it. They have to see faculty research that is well supported, that is about addressing public challenges. They have to see institutional practices like in purchasing and human resources and real estate development that reflect commitment to the public good. And it has to be built into their curricular experience that this is what really matters. So that's one thing, is that whole institutional commitment. 
A second thing is, I think we need to really be keenly aware. So we were, you know, we've been talking about this question of what experiences have you really had? Do you understand the kinds of issues and challenges? And one of the effects of being in a society that is so unequal mm -hmm. is that our students are coming to us with radically different prior experiences. Some students are coming out of communities facing the most severe challenges in health, in education, in environmental quality, in public safety. Other students are coming from lives of intense privilege where these problems have not been part of their daily experience at all and their first exposure to them is through experiences constructed through college courses and programs. And so there's, I don't have a simple answer to this, but I think in the design and delivery of our programs for students, we have to be aware that these are the different worlds that are sometimes coming together on our campuses. Sometimes our campuses are much more skewed in one direction or the other. But if our students are going to, for example, learn both the humility that some students need to adopt when they you know, undertake this work, but other students are going to also learn the confidence and the, the opportunities for them to make change, we have to think about who they are walking in the door and the realities they've experienced. And, and the third thing I would say is I just think we need to think quite broadly about education and then narrow down to social innovation work. So for example, uh, you know, if, if you're going to be dropped into a forest, which I think is what social innovation is like, right? You're trying to work in a space that, where there aren't a lot of guideposts and you're, you're making it up as you go. You need to know how to read a landscape and understand what's around you. And for me, that's about liberal arts learning, it's about understanding history, it's about having a real grasp of science, about understanding what economics tells us about human interaction and markets and whatever. And if you don't have those tools, you're, you're gonna be stumbling around in the dark. But also just about the kinds of skills we're cultivating in this kind of public-oriented work. So, you know, students taking service learning classes and understanding what it is to work face to face with people uh, across difference to solve a common problem and learning civic skills, quite specifically, how do governmental processes work? What, what is the history of these institutions? Why are they structured this way? So I think that has to be built. I know the way I think you have to be intentional in guiding students toward understanding the broad range of skills and knowledge they need to be able to make change themselves. Mm. Pamela Hardigan, who ran the, the school center, would always uh, say to our students like, that social entrepreneurship isn't something you major in. It is a, it's a mindset, right? It's, it's, it's something you overlay, right? And so we would always, that's like a term I will always use, it is a mindset. If you are a lawyer, take that social change view, right? If you are studying any varied of degrees, but we, we have focused it too narrowly on business and thinking that it's just about starting something new, but it's really taking whatever course your students are taking in your classes and giving them the mindset to say, I'm going to use my career and my life and my skills, whatever varied range of skills those might be, to have a successful career, but also have a positive social and environmental change. So we're, there's going to be mistakes, there's going to be failure, it's a learning process, we're working with, with young people, and we're working with communities, we're working in the real world. Um, what are the ethical implications that we, and I know we think about this all the time, but just want to call out that there is, you know, there is not a perfect process, however, I think there's a responsibility as educators to be aware of providing guideposts so that, you know, you don't get landed in a forest and your first thought is, let's deforest the forest. You know, how do we, how do we make sure that we're respectful and, and, and steward the responsibility wisely? And, and maybe starting with Sonal, so we keep mixing it up. I think Andrew mentioned this, and I think we just want to reemphasize this. This is why liberal arts matters. And too often, and I think within universities, there's the liberal arts education, there's the science education, there's the computer science education. But when you think about the ethical issues that undergird all of these things, um, each of those matters in every one of those cases. I work a lot with data and technology and a lot in the social impact space. And we're not even asking the question yet of who owns the community data, how is it being used, and by whom are we doing good and bad? Like, we just assume that if I use an app and if I'm using that data and I'm trying to make change in the community, that's good. But what if that data is being used by somebody else? What if you start selling that list so that's your business model and your business model is selling the names and the data to somebody else? 
what are the ethical regulations around building those farmer apps? And all of that data you own and know about those farmers, who's in charge of that? And if something goes wrong and the government uses that data in a different way in any of those countries, even in our own country, who owns that? Do we own that problem? Does somebody else own that problem? We're not asking those questions, and that's, I think, to some extent, why it matters that we think about social innovation in a very broad context, concept and not just in the individual, this is a class, this is a degree, this is a, uh, a, you know, a minor that you've got, but something that is much more about what are the issues we are trying to change, what are the ethical frameworks we need to create in order to change that, and when are we going to take responsibility if something goes wrong? Mm -hmm. um, and if it doesn't, it's OK. And if it does, we can learn from it. Not that if it goes wrong, it's all bad. It's that we just need to rapidly learn and iterate on it. Because look, the structure of institutions are changing. Whether we like it or not, institutional structures are going to change, will change, should change, frankly. And as we change those institutions, all of these young people don't believe any of the institutions are doing the right thing anyway. And in some cases, I agree with a lot of them, right? Because I think we've gotten comfortable with the institutions as they exist. But what are we going to put in place that manages to all of those problems that we also own that responsibility? And how are we going to do it? So for me, I think you know the, the kind of work that I come out of community and civic engagement has given a lot of thought over a very long period of time to these, the ethical mm -hmm. dimension of this work. And there's a lot of language about uh, reciprocal benefits and, and mutuality uh, and mutual respect. And for me, one of the things it comes down to is what are the practical uh, kind of building blocks of the possibility of real reciprocity? And I think the, the only answer to that that I've been able to come up with is deep and persistent partnerships. So when we drop into places for a short period of time based on something we thought of in advance and ask some community to be part of it or just say we're doing it there, uh, it's almost impossible for that to be genuinely reciprocal and mutually respectful. We need to build relationships over time, work with people on issues that they have identified that matter to them, where our understanding of those issues is shaped significantly by their understanding of those issues, and then think together about what we need to do, some of which might be opening up the space for innovation from students, from faculty, et cetera, but not just out of nowhere. It has to be situated in these ongoing partnerships, and that means, again, the institution has to be building the infrastructure to support those kinds of ongoing partnerships. So I was that student who, you know, went in and I went to Cambodia and I was like, I'm going to change education in Cambodia. I know nothing about education, I know nothing about Cambodia, I know nothing about your language, I know, you know, but that was the mindset. I was given accolades, I was given funds for my alma mater, I was, you know, sent off to educate, right? And we need to change the vocabulary. We talk about, it makes me cringe, this idea of lifting people out of poverty. Anyone who's worked in an emerging market knows that nobody gets lifted out of poverty. Right? People crawl their way out, work their way out. We can remove barriers. We can provide support and education and water along the way, but we cannot lift. We need to change our vocabulary in order, that's an ethical issue. We also need to talk to our students to tell them they have to, I, I thought I had the responsibility to help people, but we have to tell them they have to earn the right to impose their benevolence on someone else, right? And by doing that, it's having a learning mindset, listening, asking, apprenticing with a problem that we don't understand, all of those things. I just had one yeah. comment. You know, there's an interesting study that was just out from a Harvard professor that's worth thinking about. How many of you know about cash, check cashing? Check cashing, everybody thinks that it's a bad idea, uh, we shouldn't use it, we have to figure out how to lower those costs because they're ripping off communities. Payday loans. Payday stuff, loans, yeah. right? And what's interesting about from this professor, she actually became one of the tellers at the check cashing and at the payday loan center for four months and actually sat there and understood what the communities were going through and found out that the reason they went there was because the service was better. Right? We have spent all of our time thinking about the solution that we have thought about is how do we lower the cost so the banks go in there and they'll go to the banks. The banks aren't offering service. It's all about mobile, remote, whatever. All these communities and families are looking for is somebody to make sure that the money they give gets to the place where they need to get it to. And by the way, when you earn $10 an hour or $5 an hour, you are by far the best at spending your money well. 
When you earn $1,000 an hour, you spend it because you don't think about it. When you earn $5 an hour, you think extraordinarily well as to how well you're going to spend that money. So they knew exactly how much they were paying, why they were paying it, and for whom they were paying it. We never bothered to learn that. And frankly, one of the things that we could even teach, and we don't, I don't think we think about it, and I don't think about it from a professor's perspective, you know, even as I teach, how do I put the students in that space to understand why are people using that service, and are we solving the wrong problem? Because we might actually be solving the wrong problem. There are so many ongoing innovations and improvements happening, and the exchange is showcasing many of them. And many of you are the ones pioneering the bleeding edge, the cutting edge, the next frontier. And what I would challenge all of you to think about is to remember that just as social innovation is building on the, the shoulders of giants from, from other social change methodologies and is also building on a foundation of liberal arts and, and the entire education system and our entire kind of essence of being a, a citizen in a society, um, we are also continuing to need to walk the talk that we cannot be, uh, we can't just stay still that the world is changing around us, and if we just assume we've figured out the most cutting edge pedagogies and we stop innovating, the world will continue to evolve and we will not be able to keep up. And we will be actually doing even more ethical harm by not preparing our students to understand the full implications of, of how to do um, all of the work with the implications that we talked about today. So thank you so much, and thank you to the panelists. I really, really appreciate this. Thank you.